Um, I'm Catherine. I just wanted to say thank you to. Ooh, wow, what was that? Um, thank you to um, the culture, especially thanks to Rebecca for bringing us all to um, to Bloomington. Thank you. Um, in bloom. <laughs> in bloom. We're in bloom. Um, okay. So my title is um, What Makes Sense from Sensors to the Production of Cryptographic Consciousness. And the previous title for another version of this was, um, sorry, was What Makes Sense. And now I'm switching it to What Sense Makes. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, <laughs> who knows? Um, so um, without further ado, I'm just going to get started. One. In arrays. It's getting difficult for trees to fall in forests without non human observers. <laughs> Webcams watching moss, submersible floats that monitor ocean plastics, RFID tagged badgers, the Internet of Things, smart cities, and air pollution apps. With these case studies, Jennifer Gabris describes how, quote, sensing has come down to earth, close quote as planetary environments are enfolded and produced by, quote, a distributed and embedded range of monitoring technologies that produce discrete and localized data sets for particular purposes, close quote. Through networked analytics and feedback, the various idiosyncratic capacities of these earthly sensors come to complement the specific and particular milieus that they sense and that are entangled with them. As a result, Gavris writes, quote, environmental monitoring through <coughs> sensor networks is a practice of making and not just capturing environments as process, close quote. In other words, the sense data a sensor network senses is also indivisible from a process of fine tuning adjusting sensors' capacities to suit the worlds they monitor, even as monitoring constitutes worlds. Sensors make the world that makes their data sensible, and vice versa. So neither makes sense without the other. <laughs> These environmental sensing technologies include the devices that monitor and collect sense data about the environment, i.e. sensors, as well as the infrastructures, and algorithms that support and make sense of environmental data. Mark Andrejevich and Mark Burden point to these same non-human factors, devices, infrastructures, and algorithms, as they describe, quote, the explosion of sensor-driven data, close quote. They pin the emergence of what they call a sensor society to a marked upswing in sensor technologies through networked environments so that sensing becomes environmental, which is to say, all around. Meaningfully, Gabris contextualizes environmental sensing historically as a departure from loftier remote sensing projects epitomized by the global Sputnik consciousness of post-war satellite data collection. She situates it instead within what she calls, quote, the becoming environmental of computation, close quote and the larger project of ubiquitous computing. Remote sensing promises a global view, operationalized through values of distance, totality, vision, and knowledge. But as Gabris describes it, environmental sensing marks an inversion, both technically and ideologically. It takes place at close range via an interconnected mosaic of autonomous sensing moats or nodes. In stark contrast to the all-seeing, all-knowing satellite, such distributed sensor networks maintain a level of context-specific, nearly willful ignorance. Organized in arrays, they each are tuned in, to, and for a unique setting and application. Moreover, they follow ubiquitous computing's paradigm of invisibility, promoted by Ubicomp founder Mark Weiser. Weiser recognized how contemporary life was already brimming with quotidian objects equipped with sensors and therefore primed for computing on an environmental scale. Familiar objects like light switches and ovens had already smuggled inputs, outputs, and monitoring capabilities into human environments 
and they only awaited networking to awake. Quote, rather than making the invisible visible, sensor-enabled technologies would quote unquote disappear into the fabric of everyday life, close quote. Operating invisibly and passively, that is both discreetly and discreetly, isolated nodes in distributed sensor arrays use passive capture to make sense, capturing sense data about a world and creating their milieus such as can be captured in tune with this technically delimited sensorial capacity. So the what that sensors and the what it senses make each other for each other in ways that keep their entangled capacities <coughs> intact. As well as being imperceptible, Gabrus's sensor arrays are also anti-cognitive. That is, they substitute environmental forms of experience for the previous dream of a technically extended cognitive system of hyper-awareness. Thanks. <laughs> in light of this, her, quote, becoming environmental of computation resonates with Marx Hansen's claim that sensibility itself becomes environmental. For Hansen, this, quote, unquote, worldly sensibility or the world's capacity for self-sensing has taken on hypertrophic density and now often operates at time scales that are, in Hansen's words, quote, well below the threshold, close quote, of human senses. Seething insensibility, worldly self-sensing enfolds it all. Sensor-generated data and metadata about that data and propensities in data and metadata freshly spawned by predictive analytics. Data analytics calculate low-level data to predict higher-level trends in the process generating new data about those trends that didn't exist previously. And simultaneously, analytics establish a general sensibility, ungraspable for human sense, about predictive futures that exist only at present as propensities in worldly data. According to Hansen, humans need specific technologies if they ever hope, quote, to access this domain of sensibility, close quote. And these technologies will have functions that don't correspond at all with anything human bodies and minds can do. In his estimation, these technologies and our reliance on them contribute to, quote, the marginalization of human modes of experience, consciousness, sense perception, etc. close quote. Like the invisible background processes Gabris describes, for Hansen, the technical operations of non-human sense permit it to occur as a sort of lower level environmental process that does not necessarily culminate in higher functions of human perception and cognition. On the one hand, it's nice to picture these low level technologies as low to the ground, corresponding to two of the sensor society's fixtures, devices and infrastructures. But Hansen also calls this quote unquote atmospheric media, which he says are quote exemplified by networks and quote operate through the radical technical distribution and multi-scalar dispersal of agency, close quote. Thus, on the other hand, he is also concerned with the sensor society's third aspect, the algorithmic processes which discover potential future worlds in data itself. This is a different kind of generation of worldly data, and Hansen's terminology tips us off that outward motions of dispersal, marginalization, and distribution will be key <coughs> gestures for forming and performing this making of sense and sensible world. Throughout human history, people have trained their senses toward the world and used sense data to perceive the self's relation to its outside environment. But environmental sensing disrupts this model, or better yet, sensors decenter it. They sideline human cognition, perception, and sense, even as this outward orientation prevails. Two, in arrears. Plantations give us the equivalent of pixels for the land. Hansen's essay subtitle, quote, Prediction in the Wild, 
close quote, conjures predictive futures roaming freely under the sun of atmospheric media in untamed environments of raw data not yet cooked into the domesticated settings of human habitation, affect, or consciousness. But what we may ask is wild here, or what is the investment in wilderness? Prospecting CEOs love the prospect, data is the new oil. And this maxim yeah. ought to be doubly true when data results from an earthly probe. Deployed throughout contemporary environments, digital sensor arrays reproduce the extractive logics of conventional mining practices that also systematically harvest value from the earth. Like mining for minerals or drilling for oil, environmental sensing extracts a commodity. This time, though, it isn't earthly matter, but earthly data. Yet the dynamic Sandro Metzandra, Sandro Metzandra and Brett Nielsen call extractivism prevails. With this term, they chart a relation between capital and, quote, its multiple outsides that encompasses both the out of doors where mineral mining occurs and the wilds of prediction. They write, quote, extraction is at stake, not only when the operations of capital plunder the materiality of the earth and biosphere, but also when they encounter and draw upon forms and practices of human cooperation and sociality that are external to them, close quote. It is well documented how the extractive logics that pillage Earth's surface depths and biosphere are bred of European colonialism and its violences. For Metzandra and Nielsen, this history is also baked into all present day extractive activities as, quote, a kind of colonial imprint revealed when new fields and quarries are opened in the landscapes and spreadsheets of contemporary capital, close quote. Colonial extraction foregrounds the exploitation of living labor, reincarnated today as extraction reaches not just into data, but through data, into the outsides of human cooperation and sociality. <coughs> From this insight, Metzandra and Nielsen deftly link extractivism to non-mineral forms of systematic forced removal of raw materials, like Bitcoin and data mining, where prediction in the wild is domesticated by the fact of matter. <laughs> to be sure, out on the street to talk the talk of data mining is all about drilling down or cutting across or sifting bits and sorting mm -hmm. fragments. But algorithmically speaking, data mining operations appear incommensurate with extractivism. Analytics produce something new, novel insights, rather, remo rather than removing something that's already there. But returning to the colonial core of extractivism and its exploitation of living labor makes data mining's extractivism more evident. By repositioning humans and human data as an outside available to extraction, data mining of social media partakes of the same grim model. Significantly, Metzandra and Nielsen insist extractivism lends urgency to moments of exploitation too often covered over by dispossession. So mining social media data is extractive when it, quote, reconfigures property relations and the boundaries of privacy, in effect, colonizing both the social and the self. So to recap this informing entanglement, we start with sensor systems that concoct data. That data makes possible a worldly sensibility, which in turn shunts worldly data into the wild, where by virtue of being outside, it is available to the extractive logics of sensor systems. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> in this system, humans are abandoned to wilds twice over, pushed out in the marginalization of human sense, and recaptured as something like human resources, whether mined as minerals or tapped as data delivery, that are needed to maintain this extractive circuit. And as it happens, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin encapsulate this dynamic by combining both streams of extractive logic, mineral mining's environmental impact and data mining's reconfigurations of privacy and sociality. In Bitcoin, 
Private individuals are neither inside nor outside, but actively barricaded through encryption and competition. Bill Maurer, Taylor Nelms, and Laura, Lana Schwartz offer the term digital metalism to convey Bitcoin's extractivist imaginaries. The blockchain's networked race to crack a hash is called mining. Bitcoin's branding features icons modeled on golden coinage. The name Bitcoin miner refers to special software that works on cracking hashes. Miners are also human users of the system, and high-end customized hardware goes by rigs. Moreover, the total number in Bitcoins is pre of Bitcoins is predetermined to max out at near 21 million around the year 2140. Until then, the system is coded so that the difficulty of the encryption math will increase at an algorithmically set rate, with the frequency of new Bitcoin creation <coughs> decreasing in tandem. This design feature deliberately mimics commodity mining's notions of exhaustion and the scarcity of mineral resources. Yet, extractivism in Bitcoin goes beyond digital metalism as mere metaphor because this consuming computational work demands material infrastructures and extraordinary amounts of electricity. As Bitcoin creator uh, Satoshi, Sat excuse me, Satoshi Nakamoto explains, quote, the steady addition of a constant amount of new coins is analogous to miners expending resources to add gold to circulation. In our case, it is CPU time and electricity that is expended, close quote. As machines muscle through math, eating electricity, the environmental impact is intensive. But this is only half the equation when we recall the close imbrication of extractivism and exploitation. Making sense in Bitcoin takes work. So in cryptographic terminology like proof of work and forced work, Maurer et al. recognize a, quote, trope of labor, close quote, that meshes, quote, the labor of a community of human miners and non-human software working together, close quote. Three, encrypted. Cryptography, previously a weapon of the state, had begun to seem like a means of technological empowerment for the individual. This is from Lana Schwartz. How does human and machine labor converge in a system based on cryptographic truth, proof instead of trust, only by turning encryption itself into non-human sense? For Nakamoto, cryptographic proof of work replaces trust, but Maurer et al. find that the system is, quote, also all about trust about eliminating the need to trust governments and corporations, and about learning to trust the Bitcoin algorithm instead." Close quote. Cryptography is a what, making sense, that makes no sense to humans. As Alex Galloway writes, quote, encryption is a kind of structure that makes life difficult for other competing structures. Understood in this way, predictive data practices are fundamentally cryptographic data practices. They structure worldly data into something inaccessible to human sense. What's more, cryptographic data practices require the human abdication of sensibility, specifically and structurally, meaning the abdication is specifically human and structurally a requirement. And so the world of sensibility conjured through this prediction is inseparable from a corresponding abdication of sensibility because predictive data practices are also, by definition, cryptographic. Moreover, if the world engendered by prediction is wild, wide, and dense with possibility, the world engendered by encryption is barricaded in the name of privacy foreclosed in the name of anonymity, and remote in the name of distributed computational power. I call this cryptographic consciousness. Individuals are arranged as isolated nodes, like arrays of environmental sensors, out in the world but operating in arrears. The debt is social, a deficit of trust. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin involve retreating from the sociality of trust to, quote, take refuge, as Zach Zimmer puts it, in, quote, 
a defensive individualism mediated via mathematical contractual law, close quote. This motif of empowerment reduced to retreat, to a backing off or backing out, recalls the pre-conscious pacifying effects of Andrejevich and Burden's censor society. Implicit in what they call passiveification is the notion that human individuals, those self-satisfied empowered users of another decade, are fading from focus <coughs> while the human or human or non-human human laboring unit is pushed to the fore. The push that makes this happen is a centrifugal force, a surge that sends the social scattering out. In a weirdly evangelical move, Hansen promises a, quote, pharmacological recompense for the diminishment of human access to the world, and he declares, quote, it is imperative that we welcome the technical interface to the data of sensibility, making up the potential for our future experience, close quote. But this is what cryptographic consciousness looks like in ideological action. So what is welcome when not freely given? Why does an ethic of welcome mask an imperative? And why is this imperative at an interface, particularly one presented as impenetrable to humans? Bitcoin promises just this human impenetrability. It sells privacy but delivers antisocial isolation. Uniquely identified users are barricaded behind public keys, compulsively competing against one another, and the master timestamp clock. On the one hand, the divisive atomism of cryptography is obsessed with specificity. It hinges on a level of mathematical uniqueness that makes commensurability, or so-called cryptographic collisions, all but inconceivable. On the other hand, cryptographic consciousness encourages a maximally generalized form of human passivity that can be smothered under blanket sensorial coverage. Recall that censor societies monitor populations and environments, rolled into populations, rolled out across environmental fields. In cryptographic consciousness, we lay prone. Like dispersal of agency, this passivity is not merely a spatial arrangement. It is an outward fleeing of capacities to act. Thank you. Mm.